So I'm very much looking forward to hearing Susan speak. Over to you. Thank you, Gary. Um, so I'm going to be taking you back in. I'm going to be taking you back in time from from the first session this morning. And speaking of time, I must apologise. I cannot stay to the end of today. So if you have questions or comments for me, and you can't catch me over lunch, um, my email address is there. My UEA email address, or if you just Google my name and UEA, you'll find my UEA page with my UEA email. Anyway, picking up on the last points made just before we broke uh, for coffee. Nowadays, we, we tend to use the word immigrant for someone who is living in this country, but was born in a different one. The equivalent term in the Middle Ages, as we say, said earlier, was alien. A foreigner, in my context, was simply an outsider, someone who didn't belong to a defined community. A stranger was an incomer from outside the town, say, but not from overseas. And that remained the case in Lyon until at least the very end of the 15th century. Now, thanks to a national tax imposed on aliens from 1440 onwards, England has a stash of data on late medieval aliens, which is unique in Europe. And <laughs> since 2015, all those tax records, along with some other sources, have been easily accessible online, thanks to the England's immigrants Um, so the few things I'd already said were actually, had actually been preempted by um, Chris's response to questions at the end of the last session about the meaning of alien, which is the technically correct term for what we would now call immigrants in the, in the late Middle Ages. Um, the other thing I mentioned, which you might not have heard, is that unfortunately I'm not able to stay until the end of today. So if any of you have questions or comments you aren't able to put to me during the lunch break, um, you can get my UEA email address just by Googling my name and UEA. And I'm very happy to, you know, to get emails through that route. Um, I was also mentioning that the alien subsidy records uh, the alien subsidy was a tax on aliens, a national tax imposed from 1440 onwards. All the records from that tax are now available for free online on the England's Immigrants 1330 to 1550 website, uh, which is shown on this, on this slide here. Um, now, this project had in mind questions like these. Who were the immigrants? Where did they come from? Where did they live? What work did they do? How did they relate to other incomers and to the native population? And those are also the questions I've been trying to answer in a Lynn context. Now, at about the same time as this online database was launched, I was transcribing and analysing the medieval leet court records of the borough of Lynn. Now, Kings Lynn, of course. Uh, the leet court dealt with trading standards, public health risks, low level violence, antisocial behaviour, so it touched the lives of a wide range of people. I wasn't looking then for aliens in particular, but some were evident from their names or their descriptions. Um, having been to the back of the room, I realise you won't be able to read this, but it doesn't matter, don't worry. Um, this is, take my word for it, a small extract from the last surviving leech roll, 1434. And I've marked three entries, which I'll briefly read. Catherine Doochwoman presented as a regrater, a retailer of ale and beer for muck or refuse and for common bordery. Margaret Zeylander for regrating ale and for rubbish. John Munderson for regrating ale and beer, for harbouring prostitutes and thieves in his house, uh, leading to frequent disturbances at night and for rubbish. <laughs> now, John Munderson or Munnis is identified in the national records as a tailor from Meerhout in Brabant. Local records show he lived and worked in Lynn from at least 1426 to 1442. He was presented to the Leek Court several times as a seller of ale and beer, an eavesdropper, a night walker, and for harbouring dodgy people in his house. Now, despite these antisocial tendencies, his business was pretty successful, judging by amounts at which he was assessed for contributions to borough funds. Which brings me to another local source for Lynn, one which may be unique to that borough. 
This is an entry in one of the borough's hall books, records of meetings of the town's governing body, all accessible for free as digital images on the NRO's website. It's a list of 12 aliens living in Lynn in 1430, and they were turning in enough profit from their businesses for the mayor and council to demand license payments in exchange for them conti to continue to work in the town. These assessments were made more or less annually from 1421 to 1466. That's almost 20 years before the national tax on aliens was imposed. Um, and so they, the records end in 1466. Now, John the Bonis, or Bonison the Tailor, who on this list is the seventh entry down, was assessed at the highest sum on this list, 20 shillings or one pound. There are two other tailors, four cordwainers, a hardware man, a skinner, and there's one woman, a beer brewer called Joan. Recalling or pronouncing alien names was often problematic, hence the resort to occupational or other descriptions. The cordwainer on this list with the lowest assessment, only 20 pence, has no name at all, but he's described as a cordwainer living in Perfleet Street with an unusually tall wife. <laughs> <laughs> Let's round those linguistic problems. I've collated all the 15th century Lynn data from the immigrants database, these alien finds, the leech rolls and some other sources, and I've tried to unravel the ambiguities as far as possible. I mean, there are a lot of tailors called John, for instance. That leaves me with a conservative estimate of 237 aliens living in Lynn for varying periods between 1421 and 1466. And that's the period I'm mainly, but not exclusively, concentrating on today. Where did they come from? Well, that's the question with the least satisfactory answer. In most cases, we don't know. The best source for nationality is a list on one of the chancery rolls, now also on the immigrants database, of people who took the oath of allegiance in 1436. At that time, people from the Low Countries were seen as a potential security risk because the Duke of Burgundy, who had been an English ally, had gone over to France. Suspect nationals had to swear an oath of allegiance to the English crown or risk expulsion from the country. Now, in practice, quite a lot of people from outside the Low Countries also thought it'd be prudent to show they were loyal to the English crown. But even so, it's heavily biased towards people of Low Countries origins. And in any case, there are only 20 Lynn names on this 1436 list. I've been able to expand it a little bit from local records because they describe some aliens as Hollanders, Scots, Zeelanders, and so on. But that only brings the total up to 34. Ten of those were from Holland, seven from Brabant, five from Zeeland, three each from Flanders and Scotland, two from Friesland, and one each from France, Utrecht, Ireland and Orkney. Another 50 are described in one or more sources as Dutch, which is usually modernised as Dutch, but can equally mean Deutsch, German. For the majority, 153 of my 237, there's no clue other than their names. Now, they tend to have a vaguely Germanic ring to them, but they might have originated almost anywhere in the Low Countries or the German territories further east. I'm on firmer ground when it comes to the trades the aliens were practicing between 1421 and 1466. I've ranked them by numbers. Tailors are the most numerous. And 40 alien tailors does sound a lot, but that is over a period of nearly half a century. And many of those are only recorded in one or two years. Just eight of those 40 tailors were living and working in Lynn for 10 years or more. When all the tailors in Lynn signed up to some new craft statutes in 1449, there were 38 of them. And of those 38 tailors, just three were immigrants. Shoemakers, number two on my list. They were also a minority among the town shoemakers as a whole, but by a much narrower margin. In the 1420s, one in three of Lynn's shoemakers were aliens. So they must have been a much more noticeable presence to their fellow workers than was the case with the tailors. And that might help explain a rare instance of anti-immigrant hostility. In 1424, John Draper, 
one of the English cord wainers, was hauled in front of the mayor because he'd been overheard boasting that he'd initiated a lawsuit in London, which was going to lead to all the shoemakers of the German language in Lynn, um, de lingua Teutonica, the record says, being outlawed for felony and treason. Now, he may have been bluffing. I can't find any record of this in the royal courts, but his threat was taken very seriously. Um, Draper was grilled along with his two accomplices until he admitted acting out of malice and promised to retract. Third on my list is beer brewers, 23 of them, almost as numerous as the shoemakers. They started arriving in Lynn in the second decade of the 15th century. They were able to exploit a taste for beer, which was already well established in Lynn. Um, now, nowadays, <laughs> nowadays, we use the words ale and beer almost interchangeably, but at this period, the distinction was very, very clear. Ale had been brewed here for centuries. Um, it was relatively low in alcohol. It was a staple part of the diet for all, for all ages. It was relatively quick to prepare, but it didn't keep very well. So any substantial household would tend to brew its own and sell on any surplus. Beer, made with hops, was first introduced to this country in the mid 14th century from Northern Germany. It tasted different and it kept for months rather than days. And that made it easier to kind of upscale your brewing operation, uh, both for supply bigger domestic markets and also for export. Mm -hmm. And imported continental beer was certainly on sale in Lynn in some quantity by 1359. The local, these local assessments on Alien show that immigrant beer brewers were not there weren't huge numbers of them, between one and three most years, but they were doing very well. The last list that survives, made 1466, has just one beer brewer, but he his assessment is more than three times as much as any of the other aliens in the same year. Now, at about the time that these alien beer brewers began operating in Lynn, there was also a change in the ale brewing industry. A new class of English ale brewers had emerged, men, and they were all men, um, for whom brewing ale wasn't just a sideline, it was their core business. A few of them were doing so well uh, that they were, they'd begun to undermine the superior status and wealth which merchants in Lynn had always taken for granted. Which brings me to what is missing from this list of occupations. Not one of the mid 15th century immigrants to Lynn was a merchant. That is a complete turnaround from a century or two earlier when all the immigrants we know about were merchants. Lynn was a supremely mercantile town. I am now quite confident more than any other in England. From its beginnings in the late, late 11th century, it was shaped and ruled exclusively by merchants. Most of them were English, but some came from Scandinavia, Scotland and Northern Europe. These alien merchants settled permanently and played a full part in the economic, social and political life of their hometown. They were members of the Merchant Guild and Burgesses of the Borough, several served as mayors. Um, the last in this line of alien merchants to settle in Lynn seems to have been Siglaf Zeus of Gotland, who died in the late 1320s. During his lifetime, there was a change in Lynn's trading patterns. Um, the merchants from Scandinavia were gradually being supplanted by connections uh, with Danzig and that area with the, with the Baltic and the Hanseatic merchants in particular. Now, they had no incentive to try to settle in Lynn. They had massive trading privileges in any case. And about, so this was about the period when Lynn ceased to welcome these alien merchants into its midst. And from the middle of the 14th century onwards, any new alien names which appear are of artisans, not of merchants. So why were these artisans, as opposed to merchants, attracted to Lynn? Well, we've got a very rich merchant community there, um, which is offering a market for clothes and footwear and luxury goods. There were four goldsmiths among the alien immigrants. The traffic across the North Sea would have carried news about opportunities in Lynn to town, towns overseas. And I suspect as incomers, the aliens were less likely than their English equivalent to, re to resent the second class status which they had in a town ruled by merchants. When I gave a version of this paper um, a few weeks ago at the International Medieval Congress in Leeds, uh, 
Peter Stabel of the University of Antwerp was asking me why on earth craftsmen from low countries towns with their prestigious, highly organized craft guilds would want to come to Lynn, uh, which seemed to have such a low opinion of, of artisans. Um, um, I'm actually indebted to Eliza Hartridge, formerly of UEA and out at the University of York, for the suggestion that the lack of a highly regulated business environment was precisely the attraction. Um, I'm sure she's right. And Sheila Sweetingborough, who's been working on aliens in Kent, has come to the same conclusion. The immigrants needed homes and workshops, of course, and this is an aspect of their relationship with their host community, which is unusually well documented in Lynn. From around 1440 onwards, the local assessments on aliens increasingly name their landlords. This example is from <laughs> 1453. Um, it lists 15 individuals and it describes all but four of them as tenants of named landlords. Peter Beerbrewer, tenant of Margaret Frank, for instance. Aliens were not legally permitted to buy land. So however prosperous some of them may be, they couldn't invest in freehold property in the way that native townsfolk could. The alien subsidy records in the immigrants database tell us whether aliens were householders or non-householders, mm -hmm. but only nine of those records, and that's nine across the whole country, um, across the whole of the 15th century, only nine entries tell us the name of householders landlords. Of those nine, six are in Lynn and only one is outside Norfolk. So it looks as if identifying aliens with their landlords is a Norfolk thing and particularly a Lynn one. Anyway, whatever the reason, it opens up a new dimension to the story of Lynn's resident aliens and their relationship with the native population. Now, using the leet data, I'd already found that in the early 15th century, well over half the immigrants lived in a single ward. The borough was divided into nine wards, shown on this map, and apologies to those of you at the back who won't be able to see very clearly. Um, and that ward was Checker on the riverside, um, sort of bulging out on the left-hand side of the map. This surprised me really because that area was dominated by merchants who valued access to the quaysides, whereas the town's main industrial zone was inland in Kettlewell Ward. After 1434, the leaked rolls give out, and my data isn't so good, and I can't be confident where 134 of my 237 aliens were living, but from 102 I can place, the balance hasn't changed. Despite there being artisans, not merchants, not a single immigrant can be identified in Kettlewell. The overwhelming majority are in Checker. This is Checker Ward, as shown on a map of around 1660. The central north-south street, the Checker, runs along the line of the river bank as it would have been in the early 12th century, but the river was gradually pushed westwards over the following centuries, providing reclaimed land for development, first as quays, then warehouses additionally, and by the late 15th, by the early 15th century, um, enough land to build substantial houses. I've labelled St George's Guildhall um, because we know when it was built, between 1406 and 1430. At that time, there wouldn't have been such a wide expanse of land or so many buildings between the Checker Street and the river. And the area I've shaded in beige would probably have been submerged at very high tides, or at very least too squishy to build anything substantial on. Not all the immigrants in this ward were along the Checker itself. There were some in Perfleet Street, like the man with the tall wife. But most of the immigrants I've been able to place so far with specific properties were on the west side of the Checker, as shown here. <coughs> St George's Guild. Oh, that's come out. Something very odd has happened to that. So just don't look at it. <laughs> that's very interesting. Well, it looked fine when I checked it out at, on PowerPoint at UEA, but um, it's obviously gone completely haywire. Uh, Anyway, St George's Guild had premises to let round its hall on the west side of the Chequer, and some of the individual owners did the same. Uh, one of them is, whom you can't really see here, no, you definitely can't, was Henry Birmingham. He was a merchant with trading interests in Northern Europe. He joined the boroughs in a council of 24 in 1448. He was constable of his ward, Chequer, from 1453 to 1461, 
and he was mayor two years, 1466 and 1471. He also served seven times as one of the borough's two burgesses in Parliament. Oh, and I think he, he was also um, often on embassies to the, to the Hansa. So a leading, leading merchant in Lynn. Five out of six private landlords on the slide that you can't really see of having alien tenants were prominent merchant burgesses who served at least once as mayors. Now across the town as a whole, I've got the name of names of 44 individual landlords of alien tenants. And of these, half were merchants or their widows. 13 served at least one term as mayor. And clearly, I mean, these wealthy members of the merchant elite had no qualms at all about leasing premises to these enterprising aliens. But did the immigrants have an equal voice with their English counterparts when it came to town affairs? Okay. That's better, I used a PDF, which is nice and safe. <laughs> <laughs> Some English boroughs had a formal bar against aliens becoming burgesses. Burgesses, I should just say, being people who had full civic rights, and the number of them was very small in Lynn. It was increasing in the 15th century, but we're still only talking about between 200 and 400 people in a population of 5,000 or so. Lynn wasn't one of the towns which had a bar against aliens becoming burgesses, but in practice it didn't happen between the early 14th century and 1428, when John Bordrick, a douche pattern maker from Antwerp, was admitted as a burgess of Lynn, albeit at twice the usual fee, he had to pay four pounds instead of two pounds. Now, he appears in my alien fines list, and the sums at which he was assessed were always high from the beginning in 1421. By 1428, he was paying 20 shillings a year, which is double that of any of the other aliens. So that was presumably the reason he cut a deal with the borough. He paid four times his annual fine to become a Burgess and so escape any future demands for alien fines. That must have been a vote of confidence in his future prosperity in Lynn. And I assume he did prosper. He's last, he stayed there and he's last mentioned in 1453. Because I was curious about the small number of aliens, there's just six listed on this slide here, and you won't be able to see them at the back. Um, John Bordrick is the one I've just mentioned, Hugh Smith, um, a Smith in 1450, Peter Potter in 1483, and then three at the end, James Johnson Shoemaker, 1490, Abraham Powell, 1498, and Clement Goethe, 1498. I was curious about these people. I've recently ventured beyond 1466, which is the date of my last of my alien finds lists, to pursue two of them, James Johnson and Abraham Powell. They are the only two 15th century aliens at Lynn for whom I can find a will. Again, a nice link back to uh, Chris's paper this morning. And both have connections with immigrants in Norwich, for whom there are many more surviving wills. First, James Johnson, the shoemaker, Ah, well, clearly that's gone haywire too. So James Johnson, the shoemaker, he became a Burgess of Lynn in 1490. In the abstract of four wills on this slide, mm, <laughs> I've colour coded the names of individuals who appear in more than one will. Well, you might get a vague impression of the colours, and that's all I wanted to give, that there were connections, sometimes more than one, between these, between these various families. The England's Immigrants Database tells us that James Johnson was a Zeelander who was living in Lynn by 1483. At that point, he was a servant living in somebody else's house. He became a Burgess of Lynn as a shoemaker and described as a douche man in 1490. And he probably married not long after that. So that was 1490. His will, 1493, shows his wife Margaret was pregnant with their only child. Um, I noticed also that one of the witnesses to the will was a man named John Birdie, who had become a Burgess in the same year as Johnson, 1490. He was English, and he was almost certainly the son of an older John Birdie, who had premises, guess where, on the west side of the Chequer. So he was the first witness to Johnson's will, and I imagine he was James Johnson's landlord on the Chequer. 
Anyway, James died before the birth of his only child, the boy christened James Johnson after his father. Margaret, his wife, remarried within two or three years to Peter Peterson the Younger, a hardware man in Norwich. How did she come to meet him? There were several alien hardware men in Lynn in the middle years of the century. It was the fourth most common occupation after tailoring, shoemaking and brewing. Immigrants from the Low Countries seem to have cornered the market, the hardware market in both Lynn and Norwich. Two of the Norwich hardware men, a Fleming called Derrick and a Brabanter called Hans, had servants or agents operating in Lynn. I also suspect that a Matthew hardware man, who's recorded at Lynn in 1463, may have been the same man as the Matthew Johnson hardware man who paid the alien subsidy in Norwich in 1469 and died in 1474. Trade and family connections between aliens in different towns would have facilitated moves within the country as well as across the North Sea. Anyway, James Johnson's widow, Margaret, came to Norwich with her infant son to marry Peter Peterson, she died not long afterwards, leaving her son James in the care of a family friend called Alan Wright, who also acted as an executor. Within a year, her husband had died too, and his will names other members of the Peterson family. He also mentions a second James, James Johnson, the son of another alien hardware man called Gerard Johnson. Gerard was also connected with another Norwich hardware man, Florence or Florentius Johnson, who died in 1500. His wife had been a friend of Margaret Peterson, formerly Johnson. So you get the sort of general flavour. Florence made his wife Joan executrix, but he also appointed two helpers, whom Gerard Johnson was one. The other was Abraham Paulson. Let's see if this comes out Ooh, slightly better than the stuff missing. Abraham Powell or Paulson or Paulson has a distinctive name, a rare treat I find, which makes him easy to identify in both national and local records. And his story marks a possible turning point in the history of Lynn's medieval immigrants. Not only did he become a Burgess of Lynn as an alien, he came originally from Burgundy, I should say, but he was a merchant, the first alien merchant to settle in Lynn for almost two centuries. In 1515, he further enhanced his status by obtaining letters of denization. This involved paying a fee and taking an oath of allegiance to the crown. In return, the denizen and his descendants were supposed, supposed to be treated more or less in the same way as a native Englishman. This had been an option for more than a century for those aliens who could afford to pay for it. But Abraham Paulson is only the third man in Lynn recorded as having done so. The others were James Nicholson in 1413, he wasn't really alien, he was born in Lynn, but his father was alien and there were some challenges to his status. And the other one was a mariner called Henry Drew, alias Breton, 1414. He's a bit of a mystery. I can only find one mention of a Henry Drew in the Lynn records in 1413. Um, anyway, Abraham Paulson is my fo focus now. His main reason for denization would have been to enable him to buy and sell land. He owned properties in Lynn, West Winch, Hardwick, Runcton and to sue in English courts of law. From 1515 onwards, he was party, both as plaintiff and defendant, to various suits in common pleas and chancery. His son, Sibrand, also a merchant, was his sole heir at his death around 1539. His will is short and a little irregular, so presumably made in haste. He left pretty much everything to his son, Sibrand, who was also his sole executor. Sibrand was to have some help, however. The supervisor of this my testament and last will, I ordain and make my Lord William Rugg, Bishop of Norwich, desiring him to see this my will performed and to stand with my son Sibrand in his right with his honourable advice and counsel in time of his need, to whom I will a ring of gold, wherein shall be graven the image of Abraham for a token of a remembrance. I was startled when I read this. I've read a lot of wills of Lynn merchants, and I can't recall any others who named a bishop at all, let alone a supervisor. The prior of Lynn, yes, uh, but not, not the Bishop of Norwich. Um, William Rugg was the last abbot of St. Bennet of Home and the last, <coughs> then the last Bishop of Norwich to exercise secular jurisdiction in the borough of Lynn, Lynn Bishop, which henceforth became King's Lynn. 
He was a theological conservative. He was described as an improvident manager, manager of church estates who was strapped for cash at the time of Abraham's death. But the two men clearly had a personal relationship of some kind. I wonder what brought them together. Money, religion, legal advice, maybe both. Any suggestions would be welcome. But it's time to sum up. From the mid 14th century onwards, most of the resident aliens in Lynn came from the Low Countries and Northern Europe. In contrast to earlier immigrants, they were all artisans, people who made or repaired things or brewed beer. They tended to gravitate to the Checker area, area in particular, renting premises from property owning merchants. There was no bar in principle to their becoming Burgesses of Lynn, but very few did. And a, unlike the alien merchants who became Burgesses in earlier centuries, mm -hmm. none actually became office holders in the borough. Their alien status meant they were subject to extra taxes, both nationally and locally, but hostility to their presence seems to have been pretty rare, and when it did happen was swiftly dealt with by the borough authorities. Towards the end of the 15th century, the appearance of an alien merchant who settled in Lynn as a resident Burgess is a striking change in this pattern, but it may have been, and I guess it was, a one-off. But I'll conclude with this thought, looking forward in two senses. Um, the brief excursion I've made into records of that period suggests to me that a study of the immigrant communities in late 15th and early 16th century Norwich and their connections elsewhere would be a valuable area of future research, a rewarding PhD topic, perhaps, for someone. 